Welcome to HDO Football. This episode, we speak to Liverpool fan and writer Tony Evans. Tony takes Tom and I down memory lane for a reflection on how the game has changed for the matchday goer, as well as Klopp's time at Anfield. We also hear from Reds freelancer Tom Beattie. Enjoy. Tony, welcome to HDO Football. How are you? Are you well, given everything? Yeah, I'm good, Tom. Uh, all well with you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. I'm enjoying a bit of sunshine. Uh, been stuck um, indoors most of the week, but managed to get out this afternoon. So that is always very nice, very pleasant. Uh, has it been a busy week? Obviously, there was a bit of uh, City breaking news and some developments on the Newcastle takeover and that, that stuff. So it's sort of the ugly side of football still showing its showing its teeth as we return. Yeah, it's been a ridiculously busy week because um, you know the City news started uh, the, the seven days off with a bang. Um, and then, you know, sort of, we, we had games, which have uh, been very interesting. Um, you know, I, I was at two this week, and, you know, both of them were fairly big games. Liverpool uh, away at Arsenal, which comedy defending was very funny. And then um, last night, seeing Manchester United at Crystal Palace, and um, United could, well, they've got, they've got a great talent there. But they're not very cohesive. They weren't. They didn't play that well. But they've got the ability to pull games out of the hat. Mm. So, so I think we're in for an interesting. You know, once the season resumes in September, it'll get very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I think I think that United set on a golf piece a little bit. That's fascinating for me because you know they'll have patches of half a dozen games where they really look like they're clicking, and then suddenly actually think is Oli the kind of man they need? Actually, someone a bit. Bit younger, a bit of a ties to the club, but actually, he's just going to let let the talent play, and then it just looks uh, all over the place at other times. And you actually think, well, no, long term, it's just not going to be right. So, um, Andrew and I are both Arsenal fans, so we obviously enjoyed that first game uh, that you were back. Although I have to say, um, you know, I didn't enjoy come, most of it, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come, come January, February, or well, January, the turn of the year, anyway. Um, we, we were looking at that thing, and that might be the last chance that we got to stopping you going unbeaten. Um, but thankfully, it's not been a not been that case. What have you made of the restart in general of the Liverpool's, but just in general, how have you adapted to the to the no fans? It's felt strange, hasn't it? It's very weird. I mean, I've done um, I've done four or five games, and it's strange just approaching the stadium and then going in, and nobody's there. It's you know, people say you know the the, the cliche is football without fans is nothing. Um, you can play football, you can watch football. A lot of growing up, I went to reserve games when there'd be hardly anywhere there, anyone there. You know, I've watched a lot of non league football with a lot of players. So I, I kind of don't think the fans are absolutely necessary for football and to enjoy football, but they enhance the whole yeah. experience. And, you know, it's, it's, it, football on its own is, is nowhere near as good as with fans. So, it, I was glad they got it back up and running. Um, it, it's a little bit dispiriting seeing, you know, these stadiums, these vast stadiums, these great stadiums empty. Mm. And, you know, it's a, and the funny thing is, I, you know, obviously I've, I've been a lot of, around a lot of empty stadiums after games when you're writing them, filing. And after a game when the fans have gone, you, you can feel the resonance of the place. You can feel the ghosts. You can feel the weight of history. Mm. But in empty stadiums where the fans have never been in, it just, they feel a bit cold and windblown. And mm. so, so from that perspective, in terms of the actual games, I mean, let's talk about Liverpool first. Well, let's face it. As soon as they won the title, as soon as they had the points in the bag, the pre-season for next year started. So I'm not particularly bothered. I mean, I'm of, of the age where I saw the great 70s and 80s teams. And when they won things, it shut down. It's not worth trying. You know, other people have got something to play for. We'll just ease our way along. So I'm not very concerned about this idea of 100 points. I mean, who cares? Mm. You know, it's, um, I, if, if you win the league with 70 points, you've still won the league. Mm -hmm. That's all that matters. Yeah. So and I think, you know, I think Klopp is thinking about next season. I think he's thinking about the fact that City could well be playing until, you know, almost the last week in August, mm. that Liverpool have a massive advantage over the competitors at this time, so I think you got to look at it into that, you know, in that point of view, and also the players. It's hard for them to get themselves up for it, you know. Yeah. It's a, a, a very interesting there at Arsenal. The two comedy errors that you know we expect them from the likes of Luis, you know, it's um, but you know, come from Allison and Van Dijk, and they were the two 
really final pieces in clubs jigsaw that turned the team into winners so you know what if you're going to make a mistake make it at that time of year oh, I know. Yeah, it's, you know, it's absolutely true and, and as a you know i'm an arsenal awesome season to get older and obviously not been going since the, the return i'm not, I'm not lucky, lucky like yourself but um but yeah i mean if we're looking at liverpool littered with such stars but like and um, such fantastic players but Definitely, those two you look on with with envy. You know, we, we you know how badly we'd like a Van Dijk, and yet the irony of ironies, he's he's the one making the error. But, I was, um, was going to say those those sorts of mistakes are at home at the Emirates. We see plenty of that type of error. Was it was it our first win over Liverpool though? Since yeah, since Klopp, under Klopp, when Klopp's under been there, Klopp, yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. So it was over June, like it. you said. Um, for, you know, for Liverpool, I'm, I'm not sure it mattered a great deal. Um, once the title's been won, the yeah, I think won. I think a lot of this, a lot of this sort of not criticism is probably the sh- strong word to use but I just think it's just ridiculous really I mean they've wrapped up the title with plenty of games to spend Early, earliest I'm, ever I'm, yeah I'm earliest ever watch. earliest ever it's just they need, people need to take a break don't they really yeah yeah, yeah I, 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 you know um, you know when you can afford to lose when you can afford to make mistakes you've done something right yeah and, and I do think that the Although, you know, with one respect, City have still got the Champions League, so therefore you'd expect that would be their focus. Once Liverpool had gone out to Atleti, like, the wrapping up the title was it. That was it. That was it. all they needed to do. Wrap that in the bag. And then actually, like you said, it actually probably switches to September or hopefully when we get underway then in terms of, you know, that can, that can be the focus. The guys have got to be on holiday now and you can't really blame them. <laughs> what, is, what is that like, though, for you? Um, we're not quite at the 30-year... Um, past mark in terms of an Arsenal fan for the last time we won the title but um, whilst we never sort of achieved the heights that the Liverpool team of the 70s and 80s did um, Andrew and I were both sort of in teenagers um, in the late 90s and early 2000s where Arsenal enjoyed a, a good period of success you know sort of three league titles FA Cups a lot of them uh, one Champions League final although we never got over the line as, we, as everyone will know in the European Cup uh, but nonetheless we were a little bit spoiled in that age you know that 13, 14, 15, 16 years old we're doing well at the late 90s early 2000s and we've gone what 16 years now without the title and let's be honest doesn't look like it's on the horizon for the next few at least um so 30 years that's got to, that was that must have felt good yeah i mean it's you never expected to take so long i mean the last time arsenal won the title you know you, you couldn't have imagined that it would be 16 years i mean i didn't imagine it but once that clock starts t- ticking you know you, you, it really does start moving and the, the years fly and with every misstep a club takes then it stretches that period um and i think i think arteta's got a hell of a job in front of him i think it's uh, going to be very very difficult to turn it around um you know notwithstanding the fact that liverpool lost they absolutely battered arsenal and pinned them back into their own half for long periods of the game mm-hmm. i thought i thought uh, they started off fairly brightly and and then Liverpool just turns up the pressure more and more. What struck me most is that Arsenal didn't have a player that they could get an outlet ball to, no one they could knock it up and who'd hold it up and allow the back line to push up a little bit. And so yes. the ball was coming straight back. I mean, you know, I mean, the much maligned Giroud would have been someone who yeah, would have been about to mention up. Giroud, yeah, yeah, in a game like that, you know, mm. and then um, and. I think the balance is all wrong. There's good players there. I mean, clearly, you know, the you know Lacazette is a danger to anyone. Very sharp, was a very quick, clever player. You know, the, some of the kids coming through, you know, look pretty good. Tierney was excellent. You know, and so you think that the, the, there are there are players there, but the balance isn't right. The midfield's not right, and the defence, you know, the centre of defence really does need to be addressed. Yeah. For, 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 yeah, for many years. Is that what you, is that was, as, as a fan, when you saw Klopp starting to address that balance in the Liverpool team, is that when you started to think, look, this, we could have something here? Because Liverpool had, Liverpool had been close over the last sort of 10, 15 years on a couple of occasions. Obviously, there was the Jarrah Slip year, but even before, I think it was 09, where the Gerard and Torres That's put a great run, yeah. run together. You know, they've had good teams before, but they've probably not had the balance. And what Klopp's come on and then literally pinpointing where you needed it, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you look at the 2008-09 side, I mean, they actually were a very well-balanced side. But love them as I do, and I do love them. Rafa's cautiousness cost us that year. And, you know, it, uh, I mean, there was three nil-nil home draws where if he would have just been a little bit more adventurous, he would have won the title. So I think that was the problem there. I think 
one one of the interesting things in, uh, in the 2014 is in the January window, uh, Brendan Rodgers wanted a defender. He wanted a centre half, and at that time they were looking for they were looking to get Salah in, um, and Rodgers scuppered the deal because he wanted the centre half. Of course, they never got it, and Liverpool's recruitment told the owner there were no defenders out there, and I was I was like, well. Actually, defence is the easiest and simplest position to fill, the cheapest position to fill. You know, it's a, if you say there's no 30 goals a season, strikers out there, I go, yeah, yeah. But the, the attitude was, it was hard to find defenders. Well, mm. you know, Klopp looked at it and thought, right, this fella can play, um, Van Dijk. And interestingly and depressingly enough for you as Arsenal fans, do you know that he was offered to you when he was at Celtic for 13 million? Mm. And your scout said he wouldn't, wasn't good enough for the Premier League. Thanks, thanks for that, Tony. <laughs> Just rub the salt in a bit more. Well, yeah. I, I don't think we. I, I mean, I don't. I'm not going to be. I don't think I'm going to accuse Klopp of being cautious, Tony. But do you think there's been a difference this season in the Liverpool setup? Because a lot of people have been commenting on last season them being a little bit more gun ho, I guess, anything. and in games they've managed them better this year. Do you think that's true? Definitely, definitely. There's been a there's been a big change of style, really. And it was, it's more to, to do with the development of the, the, you know, the, the full-backs, the wing-backs. And, I mean, Klopp, and, and I think one of the great things about Klopp, when he comes to Liverpool, I thought he was a template manager. He played 4-3-3 all the time. Um, you know, the, the, the gag and press and heavy metal football. I thought, mm-hmm. you know, this is his shtick. And he'll, he'll go to the ends with it. What he's done, he's proved how pragmatic he is. Because when he saw the, the, mm-hmm. the two wing-backs develop, you know, he saw he saw Trent coming through, and then he, you know, and initially he wasn't that keen on Andy Robertson. He hardly played him until the December. You know, it's uh, in his first year there. When, once he saw what they could do, he changed his entire style. And I think one of the things that people haven't taken into account so much is that what he did is he jumped the idea of a traditional midfield. Liverpool don't do what you conventional midfields do because you want your midfielders to get up on the edge of the box and score. They're not there for that role. They're there to provide balance, to mm. let the wing backs do their stuff, to mm. let the front three do what they do without worrying about track and back. And so they're, they're, they're essentially, I wouldn't go so far as to say they, they perform a negative role, but like I say, they restore balance where in, in the areas where the balance could be shift out of place. And one of the reasons people, I think, haven't, caught up with them yet is because they haven't realised you see a lot of teams come to to play against Liverpool and they flood the midfield area it's like that's not what you need to be doing that's not where you're going to stop them Mm -hmm. so I think Klopp's pragmatism has been great and I think it's been very different and not quite as flamboyant and not quite quite as um, forward looking as probably the previous two seasons. Mm, I mean, we're talking about Liverpool midfield. One one man that came up a few weeks ago on one of our episodes actually is Jordan Henderson. Um, mm. Where does he rank, Tony, in Liverpool captains over the years? It's a it's a pretty good it's a pretty good group of players, you know. He's a, but he's proved his leadership and he's proved he, he does deserve to be up there. I mean, I think the greatest is Sunes. You know, we'll always look at look at him, and um, you know the man was a beast in so many ways. You know, uh, brilliant, snide, vicious. You know, all the things you want in a, a good central midfielder. Um, Jordan Henderson is the same bracket as people like that, like Ron Yates, and you know, and and Steven Gerrard. Because the the the, the, the very interesting thing about Jordan Henderson is that right from the start, the owners didn't really want him. The owners didn't want him. And the, um, the, um, they, they really would have jumped him off at any point. His managers mm. didn't really want him. And, um, you know, Brendan Rodgers tried to shift him to Fulham. Mm. And, um, you know, and what he's done, he's fought to maintain his position at Anfield and developed into a player that's crucial into the, into the way Klopp does things. Mm. It's almost that sort of a quarterback role at times, isn't it? His passing range is very much underrated, I think. Yeah. He's, he's, one of the functions he performs is they, they need to recycle the ball, quick, keep it moving and switch it. Because one of Liverpool's greatest sort of uh, points of attack is to shift the ball across the pitch. 
And most often, we notice the long ball, the diagonal ball between the wing backs. Mm. But a lot of the time, it gets shifted through the centre, and he moves it on very, very quickly. And it's a, you know, a lot of the time it looks as if it's sideways. Sometimes it's back, and he's taking a lot of stick from the crowd. You know, he's taking a lot. A lot he, he, he struggled to win over the owners. He struggled to win over certain managers, and he struggled to, to win over the crowd. Is that is that but, Tony? Is that because is that is it because he's not Steven Gerrard? In part, in part, you know, it's um, but it, mm. I think it's it's also he does the dirty work. He does the stuff in the trenches. Mm. The stuff mm. that certainly one one of the things I've seen in my sort of life following football is the people who do. The mucky jobs have got less appreciated because most people now watch football through the lens of television. So you follow the ball, you follow the action, you follow, you know, the, when you're in the ground, you can see the, the, the bigger picture and you can see people, what they do off the ball. But more people these days watch it through television, you know, and that's great. I think it's brilliant. Everyone gets a chance to see it. Whereas we were lucky for you back, you know, back 30, 40 years ago. Mm. But it means that sometimes the impact of a player doesn't get noticed by uh, people who are sitting in their own living rooms. Mm. And again, they don't see it as talk and you don't see him cajoling. One of, one of the things that he did brilliantly, when, um, when Milner was playing at left back and sometimes getting overrun, Henderson would always drop in and give him cover. When no one else was giving him cover, he'd do that. Again, most people don't even notice it because they're fixated on the ball. Mm. But, you know... When you, know, when you speak to his coaches, when you speak to the players who play with him, they love that sort of thing. Mm. And that's why it's appreciated. And, of course, in Liverpool, and, you know, in a lot of places, I'm not just, I, I don't want to get into Scouts particularism here, but we do love uh, football icons to, to stand for something more than just playing on the pitch. You know, mm. the Shankly thing, you know, the man of the people. And Henderson and his behaviour this summer, with, you know, with the food banks, with yeah. gathering the players together and, you know, contributing, facing down, essentially, the criticism of the Conservative government. He's elevated himself that way off the pitch as well. You know what? He's just, he's just a, a class act. And I think um, all those critics now should be blushing because mm, he yeah. deserves any accolades he gets. Mm. I think there's something in, in the fact that you said that that tough start he did enjoy. And actually, I was speaking to a friend of mine about he was reviewing the Liverpool squad. And actually, if you look at them, a lot of the standout performance or players, or players I certainly really admire there, actually, they, you know, they've either had a tough start to their Liverpool career or they've even been plucked from sort of like a, a championship side or a relegated side, you know, like we stand Robinson, went Aldham as well. Jimmy went down with Newcastle and actually look at that top player. Mane was plucked from Southampton, although while he was always looking like a talent, plucked from Southampton. And actually, they almost know what it's like to be uh, to potentially not in a in a championship winning side, not in a not in a Champions League winning side, and actually it means more to them, and you can see it on the pitch, and actually you can see it in the way they play as well, and actually so therefore the title they've gone on and won, it means a lot to the fans clearly, but you can see it means a lot to those players as well. They've not coasted through their careers in top top clubs all the way, and actually that's something that really stands out. Um, the point you said there, which I really like as well, is that the people off the pitch. And, uh, and the, the affiliation with the, the, the city and what it means to, to Liverpool um, to have players that are representing them in that light. We had, a, we had the producers um, and, and, the, and the chief editor on from the, the Sunderland Till I Die documentary. And, and I don't know whether, um, whether this is true or whether it just feels that way. But, you know, I'm an, I'm an Arsenal um, a lad. Of, I'm a season ticket holder. But coming from London, like I have, there's a lot of clubs in London. You know, there's a lot of clubs. And actually, I don't know whether the, 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 the Sunderland producer said when Sunderland Football Club are doing well, the city feel like they're doing well. And yeah. there is not that tie for a London club, in any London club, because it's so um, diverse and there's so many clubs, there's so many people. If Arsenal Football Club are doing well, it doesn't mean the city's doing well and vice versa. Um, whereas for Liverpool... Uh, and a lot of the Northern clubs, they do have that, don't they? They really do the heartbeat of the city is the football club. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, sort of, Liverpool in particular, because of its history and the way sort of, it's been out of step polo, uh, politically, socially and economically with the, the mainstream country for, you know, for much of its history, is, um, feels like it, it, it's an outsider. And you know, we do get a lot of criticism in the press. There's a lot of stereotypes. And... The, the clubs are flag bearers for the community, and I include Everton in this as well. And you know they do work hard 
you know, on things like food banks and engaging with, you know, the, the local community. And it feels like it's part of your identity. And I think that's, um, I mean, sometimes it got, you know, it can get a bit skewed. You know, we, you know, we can, um, we can take it much too seriously. And, you know, there are many instances of that in, in our past, but it's important to realize how, you know, football clubs are more than just, the more than just entertainment business businesses, the more than just, the more than just money making entities. What they uh, they have a deep connection to the community they come from, and Arsenal does as well. You know, it's a, sometimes it might get lost in, you know, in, in the, the fact that you know you're in one of the biggest cities in the world. But you know, it's a, you know, I always think that when I go to Arsenal, I look around the place and I think, you know, this was this was a club that was started by by workers. You know, at a you know, a, a, an artillery factory, and you know, and I think that's amazing. And there's still, you know, there's still a great sense of community, you know, in among Arsenal fans. So it, it's not just Liverpool, and it's not just Sunderland, but perhaps again because it's in the yeah. capital, because it's a glamorous club, you, you yeah. know, it attracts people who don't quite connect that way and understand that way. Well, Liverpool, yeah, as well. yeah, no, no, I'm sure it's just a little bit to do with the evolution of the game as well, and I think, yeah. you know. I, I certainly very much miss hybrid. I know a lot of a lot of fellow Arsenal fan, uh, fans do, but I, I think it's uh, yeah. The, 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 those ties do feel like they're slightly being eroded year on year, and I and I just wonder whether mm. in, in such a sort of uh, huge city like London with so many different top, and so many top teams, you've got to say that you know, so it's only Premier League teams and um, that the affiliation and the ties it does feel like it's eroded a, a little bit, which is for I me a shame. I think that's why as well a lot of fans from other clubs, particularly myself, we look on on in envy really with those big European nights that still happen at Anfield and I look and watch and think oh wow like this is so special um they've managed to somehow keep that feeling that Tom's I think alluding to really yeah it, I mean it is I mean I've thought over the years that we've wrapped too much of our identity into the football club um <laughs> you know so I'm, I'm not entirely sure it's a completely healthy thing the positive sides of it are brilliant but it's not it's not completely healthy. I, I think it's definitely not. I mean, it, it determines my mood, certainly. Um, <laughs> which, you know, I never think is a phenomenal thing. Um, obviously, you, 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 you know, your book, Far From Land, uh, Far From Land you, you wrapped up number six last year. You're going to have to update it, aren't you? Um, no, I think <laughs> I, it, it's one of those things where it is, well, you know, we're talking about football culture and we're talking about the changes in the game. I mean, th that, that book was written after Istanbul. It was written in the summer after Istanbul. I mean, it's a short book, so it was knocked off relatively quickly. And, and But what it was about it was about my experiences as a football fan. Because I came to journalism very late. I came after Hillsborough. When I was 29, I came to journalism. And um, I just went to match as a fan. You know, it was, it was not an affectation. It was what everyone wanted. You went to match with your mates, you know, and it was cheap and easy to do in those days, which I wish, I wish people could experience what it was like to do that. You know, now to get a ticket, you need a letter from the Pope and, uh, and the Vatican's bank accounts. You know, it's, <laughs> it's too expensive. And then, never mind getting trains across the country. You know, we'd just get up in the morning and go to, you know, if I wanted to go to Highbury, which I always did, I'd, I go down, buy me ticket in the morning, go on the eight o'clock train, pay at the gate, and be in, in the clock end. Mm. It was brilliant. You know, it was yeah. just a, a great way to live. So, I was writing about that and the changes in the game, and and it's, you know building up to Istanbul, and it's a snapshot of football history, I, 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 Liverpool history. But I think it's about a wider football culture mm. that in the in a say well at that point it would have been in the. 20, 25 years of me going to matches and, and I tried to sum up the, the good parts and the bad parts about it, bust a few of the myths, um, you know, about hooliganism and, and that sort of thing. And and try and write honestly about what it was like to be a fan and, and go through things. And I mean, I must admit, I, w w what probably makes it more readable in a sense um, is that I have experiences that relatively few people have, thankfully, of being at Heisel and being at Hillsborough and to a lesser extent being at, in Rome, you know, and the violence there. Mm. And so I, I, I could talk about that and, and the, the, the forces that led to it and try and give a nuanced but truthful um, 
description of how we got to those places, how we got to those tragedies, and how mm. we, you know, how the dark side of football was was coming and how it was generated. So that's what the book was about, really. And and I, I think it stands where it is. I mean, I think if I wrote a book about supporting Liverpool after that, it'd be a very very different experience. Istanbul was the last time, and I, I suspect you had the same thing the year after in, um, in Paris. It was the last time that everyone who went to a Champions League final, European Cup final, everyone who went basically got in. Anyone who wanted to get in, got in. You know, it's, um, but there, there were tickets outside, you know, everyone, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, the corporate thing was creeping in, but it wasn't so pervasive, you know, it's, um, and, and it was a kind of, for, for, for me, it was almost like a gathering of the clans. Everyone you knew went to match for, you know, 30 years we're in Istanbul. And I guess it was the same for you in, 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 in Paris. By the time we got to uh, the, the, the year after Paris, when we got to Athens, it had changed. There were thousands of people who travelled with no, no sort of, no, no, no prospect of getting a ticket. You know, and they just went to be part of the experience, which was very strange and very weird for me, you know, at the time, because I thought, if you're going to go, you want to get in. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and, and if you extrapolate that to last year in Madrid, you know, I, I, I was, it was, it was depressing to see the number of people who were just, who come. And they just said, there was never, they never even thought they might get in. They were just like, we're going to watch it in a bar. And, yeah. you know, it, and coming out after the press conferences, when it finished and you walk on the streets, there was loads of people in, in, in sort of around and about talking in a multitude of languages, you know, and then, but it, it's, it struck me that a lot of them were, were seeing, in fact, some of them actually told me, you know, a couple of them told me they were seeing the first Liverpool game mm. and, you know, I've, and, and good luck to them. But felt just a little bit depressed and it felt a bit like the game had moved away once when you went regularly. You could be fairly certain that you'd be part of the big occasions. Mm. Now you can no longer be certain that that will happen. Yep. And there are people who have access for different reasons, wealth, power, and you know, sort of connections who will get into these big games and never go to any others. And we, you know, we complained about the cup final all our lives and for years and years. Uh, you know that that the, the fans didn't get enough tickets. What's well, got even worse, especially Champions League games. And I find that I find that it changes the dynamic of the mood in the stadium. It changes yeah. the sense of what the, the occasion about. And I, I don't want this to be perceived as me wanting to keep people out and saying it should be an all scouts experience. Because one of the things I think is Liverpool and Arsenal clubs like that. Have become global clubs, and we should welcome fans from everywhere. You know, because they they are committed. They love the game. They love the club, and the, you know, I don't want to exclude them. Mm. But I do think the people who put the effort in go regularly should yeah. be rewarded for big games, and that's not happening. That's depressing. I think yeah. there's I think there's an argument here really that over the last few years there's a shift. I think with fans that used to go to games were sort of like the majority of what the club fan base stood for, and I think now we're seeing that fans at the games are actually the minority, and yeah. the majority are the ones that are getting the TV experience on online street, all this stuff. And I just feel that there's that's happened since the Premier League's inception. Really, would you agree, Tony, with that? Definitely, definitely. And, you know, sort of as television became more and more important to the game, the balance is weighted that way. And, and I, I think there's a lot of positives about it because we get to see football all the time. We get to see mm -hmm. games we, you know, didn't see in the past. I mean, I remember, you know, sort of it, the only way you could see European Cup semi-finals, for God's sake, was mm -hmm. the highlights. And sometimes you didn't even get highlights or going. And, you know, that was just silly. But I think the balance is skewed, and you know, and I understand that uh, the the money that the, the the big corporations pump into the game is crucial to it and all that. But uh, it 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 is. It, it's I suppose for me, and you know, sort of, and 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 use boys who've you know been around, you know, sort of quite a while, not as long as me, but you know, <laughs> quite a while. It's when when you've seen the old ways and you've seen. How, how, how great it was and how, how the sense of community, and we're back to sense of community, how strong the sense of community Absolutely. was in those days. I think when you see it now, and it's a different sense of community, I suppose 
I suppose it's just different, and I'm just an old, an old uh, complainer. No, I, 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 you're you right. Say I that, Tony, but you, you're right because ultimately you, you cannot have that sense of community unless you're with that community. So, our, you know, my earliest football memories were were actually a lot of the time not not the games itself. So it would be going and queuing for a ticket outside the Arsenal box office with my old man, and you know you'd have to go really early in the morning sometimes to get the ticket, tickets you want and get to the front and which ones you got left. And you know, but we'd be queuing up at sort of five six a.m. But you'd recognise all the same faces for each week that you're queuing up there, and you, you, you know. Same people, oh, you beat me this morning, you know, I was late in the traffic or whatever it is. Um, and you know, very much queuing for your Sky Sports season pass on a, on a, on a hold on a phone is very different to queuing up for a ticket uh, in the morning. And um, like you're saying, if you extrapolate that to to now, I mean, the the Arsenal example would would argue and I appreciate it's not the Champions League final, but you know, look at last season's final Baku. You know, in the middle of nowhere, impossible to get to for both Arsenal and Chelsea fans for the Europa League final. Um, I didn't travel for that reason because it was extortionate to get there, taken however many days. And that decision was probably not made with, well, it clearly wasn't made with the finalist fans in mind. <laughs> um, and, you, you know, and you, you, you compare those two scenarios. So is, is football, has football evolved? Is that a good thing? Absolutely, yes. Um, but it, it's, it is a shame that actually, for me anyway, that it's moved away from being part of the community and actually um, to be maybe sort of favouring necessarily the, the online audience or, or football audience there, which yeah, you can argue. Way, yeah, sure. I couldn't agree more. I think, and 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 the Baku thing was really dispiriting because you know it, it's it, it. I mean, but, but people people are, are quite sneery about um, Arsenal and Chelsea. You know, it's um, and they give it. You know, there's there's they always give this idea that you know, oh yeah, the new fans. You know, they've only been recently come to the game and all that. Well, look, I've been around a long time. I I I I went to Highbury. I went to the Bridge back in the seventies, and you know what? Both of those clubs, their their core fan base is as solid as it ever was. And you know what? Another myth. I, 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 I want to bust here. The Highbury Library. It was never a library. Library. It was always quite a lively place to go. Sometimes a little too lively. But you know, it's um one of those places where um it, it, it's you know you always got a hostile reception there. Certainly we did. And um so you know, but all these myths have grown up. I, I think. There's so many people who wanted to go to Baku from both clubs who were just priced out of it, and yeah. and when when football does that to you, it something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Were you were you there in '89, Tony? Were you at Anfield '89? No. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um great night, wasn't it? Great Friday night. Yeah. Funnily <laughs> enough, it was. It was one of those nights where you know we had six weeks of real misery, and. Um, and when when uh, Michael Thomas scored, it was like there was a gasp on the cop, you know, and like and silence. And someone behind us, someone somewhere, said, "You know what? Where's things happen?" Mm. And it was a kind of a release. It was like, "Yeah, where's things happen? It's it's only the league." And we were drinking later on with some Arsenal fans, and they were like, "You seem happy." It's like you know, you think you'd won the league, and it was it was like a weight lifted. You know, it's like. Do you know what? Goes on. Football goes on. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually, and that's that's a really a cathartic moment. I'd never actually thought of it that way because growing up, um, obviously I was too young to go, um, but growing up, looking at it at night, I've always thought of it only from the one perspective of given everything that Liverpool had gone through as a club and as a city that year, that must have been really, really bad. Like losing the title it must have been, you know, just a way of talking about But actually, it would be a way of actually saying it's so insignificant at that time. Um, yeah. I, I'd hate to remember that year for doing the double. You know, it's a, I personally didn't think we should have played again, but I understood that we had to. So it's, mm-hmm. it, you know, and, and it was one of them. Well, that's interesting. You know, all the talk of this season and the, you know, the, the coronavirus, tainted title and, you know, um, asterisks and all that. They could have said that about Arsenal's title, but wasn't. It wasn't. It was like, and you talk to the Liverpool players who played that day in Dalgleish, and they would they would never countenance any criticism. Else. They would never use as an excuse, you know, what what had happened. They were like, you know what? When you got on the pitch, you got to win. Simple as that. You know, Arsenal Arsenal won. Arsenal deserved it. And and you know, so there's never been any question about that. And there shouldn't be any question about Liverpool's title this year. I don't because, think there will be in the years to come. There won't be. Yeah, they won't. It's just. 
it's, it's things like that said at the time, um, you know, from from good places and bad with people trying to tear it down or not. They just wonder whether it's the truth. But I think in years to come, history books say title and that's it, you know, and, yeah, and exactly. fans remember that. So, and, and, you know, I mean, one of the things is I think, well, you know, that, that 89 game is one of the most significant in the, the game's history for many reasons. And sometimes, you know, it's like one of the things that I've come to learn and, and I kind of, already got it by 89, funnily enough, is that sometimes it's important to be, to, to be able to say you were there at big games, even if you lost them. I mean, for example, I was there in the 88 Cup final at Wimbledon, a game people would talk about for, you know, for, for a long, long time. And we got beat. Had we won, who'd be talking about it now? Mm. Who'd be talking about it? No one would be talking about it. You know, it's... Um, mm. and yeah, an FA Cup win against Wimbledon, you know, is that much, you know, does that mean as much as a, you know, that's upset that people talk about Laurie Angeles for, for many, many years, you know, so. Yeah, and, and it's, it's sometimes football's history, its richness is about more than just winning. It's mm. about, it's about big events that people will talk about for a long time. Mm. And if I'm lucky enough to be there, you know, I can't complain, even if we get beat. So it's, I think that's, mm. uh, you know, I mean, obviously when the goal goes in, you're upset, mm. you know. Uh, and I think that's a sense of that's the sense of community that all football fans will always feel. That we know you're you're Liverpool and I'm Arsenal, but I know what the highs feel like and I know what the lows feel like. You know, and, there, and there's always going to be that balance, isn't there? At the end of the day, when when you when you get out of those turnstiles and walk home, you know, uh, it's more it's things are more important, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's one of the great things about going the match, and which the people who can only watch on television will never know, because you know. You get beat. You know, you're not happy. You go out and you go, you know, especially away from home, you go, you, you, you go out and you've got to get home. So, you know, maybe you go for a pint, you go with your mates, you talk, you go into a pub, you have a couple of drinks, suddenly you have an adventure, you know, and you've forgotten the results. I mean, what do you do at home? Yeah. Kick the cap, go to bed. You know, it's, yeah. um, you know, it's like, you know, that, that, that's part of the great thing about football and the, the community and, and being with people is mm. that, if you are beaten and, and there is a bunch of results, mm. you're laughing again within five minutes with your mates. Yeah, um, or like a, a late, late equaliser when you're there. Uh, you know, when, when you're at home, it's a point. A point's a point. When you're there, a late equaliser, what a comeback or whatever, it means yeah, so yeah. much. You I, know. Always like, I always liken to it to a, like a pilgrimage, Tony, a little bit. You know, that build up to the game, your journey there. It's very ritual, isn't it? Oh, yeah. 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 It's, you know, it's... And, and, it all plays a part in the experience, you know, it's, um, mm. which you'll never get from just turning the telly on. And yeah. again, you know, I, I don't want to seem down on the people who can only watch on television because, you know, I, you know, so to, I, I think it's great that they can watch. And I just feel fortunate that I've had the experience mm. as a fan of being able to witness football regularly and, mm. and, and enjoy it, you know, by being there live and being with me mates and being with people around me and relating to everyone, talking to opposing fans, which happens a lot more than fighting with opposing fans. You know, it's, um, and it was just a great experience. And, you know, people often say to me, you know, it's like, um, you know, do you wish you were young again? I'm like, nah, not what I've experienced. You know, <laughs> I'm glad I am where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. I say talking of, of luck and, and actually, or, or as much as I, I love a nostalgic chat because Arsenal need to live there at the moment because we're not very good in, in, the, in, the, in the present. I was going to say if we could flip forward and just have a look at next season and actually what that holds, um, um, just quickly in terms of a, a future look. A, do you see the landscape of the, the, the challenging sides changing? Obviously, Liverpool have sort of won it slightly out of cancer this year. Um, you've got to think Man City will come back hard next year. If five subs, which I hope not, but if five subs stay around as well, personally, I think that will favour Manchester City, um, <laughs> you know, over the course of a season, um, you know, with the squad that they'll have. Um, what do you reckon the shape of the next season? I think it's going to be a, a big fight between Liverpool and City. Uh, I think it'll be much closer. Uh, it will be interesting to see how the playing on, through into August affects City when Liverpool have a bigger break. Um, I think, I think Arsenal will be closer. Uh, Tottenham should be closer. I mean, they haven't got a lot of money to spend either team. So, but there's a lot of talent there, and I think. Tottenham go down, Tony. That's that's the future. 
So well, I'm gonna go, we wouldn't want them go to, to actually go down. Obviously, I wouldn't want that because we don't know rivalry. But just sort of, they can just hover around 16th would be fine. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe just for a year. Yeah, back up. yeah, we'll yeah we'll do that just for a year. They can go down for a year. That'll be that'll be fine. Yeah, you know, it's a, but I, I I think they've got to be much closer. Um, I think uh, Wolves obviously are going to be competitive. I, I think uh, Chelsea. I don't think Chelsea. I think people are a bit too optimistic about Chelsea at the moment, and and the buying it looks very good, but the bought up front where the defence is, you know, absolutely terrible. Um, you know, they need to sort themselves out at the back. So I think it will be a two horse race. I think it'll be much more competitive for the other two Champions League spots. Um, I, I, I think I think Arteta has more room for growth as a manager than Mourinho does. So I think in that sense, Arsenal have a great scope for development. Mm. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I think that there are enough good players at the Emirates to with one or two judicious buys and a bit more organisation that they can move in the right direction. I think, I think Tottenham are, have got real problems coming up. Um, you know, sort of Mourinho, the Mourinho effect. Well. Mm. Stadium no, repayments as well. Yeah, yeah the sta- the, they're saddled with the stadium. You can't see Harry Kane staying maybe one more season. But if you know, if, if they just continue to not win trophies, that situation and the Mourinho meltdown, um, which has already probably started in in, in a way of. Um, in, in in some ways, Arsenal overpay, but Tottenham certainly underpay. And there's only two way two ways you keep players at clubs: you pay them the going rate, or you win trophies. And mm. Tottenham do neither. So you do fear for them there, um, you know. And I, I think, I think they do, they do run the risk of being overtaken by people like Wolves who've got a lot of money, you know, put into it. And and you know what? If if Everton finally spend the money in the right way, Everton surely have got to start putting pressure on at some point. Yeah. I mean, but I don't see, I don't see anyone at this stage. Reaching the levels of Liverpool and City, and um, so I think that, that, that in, in some ways it's a bit dispiriting in the sense that City have the freedom to spend relatively, uh, well, well, spend big still, and um, so I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, I, I wasn't surprised that. You know, all the other top six teams put submissions to the Court of Arbitration for Sport in the in the City UEFA case. You know, obviously, they none of them are happy with what's gone on, and none of them are happy with City. Uh, they, they feel that City are, have bought themselves an unfair advantage and broken the rules, and they still feel it, despite the judgments. Um, so th- there'll be a lot of resentment towards them, and the, the resentments will probably get worse as City improve next year. Well, I was thinking, talk, talking of next season, I, for me, the elephant in the room is VAR. Um, I, I just, this, since the restart, it seems to be a catalogue of errors at the moment, doesn't it? I think last night, the United, the Palace game that comes under scrutiny again, is, for me, next season is a huge, huge test of the resolve of VAR. <laughs> I, I, you know, Andrew, I, I, one of the problems I have with it, right, I have right from the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of American football. And, uh, and I've worked in American football in the past. And they, they had instant replay. And the one thing that proved was that it didn't solve your officiating problems. It moved the controversy into a different area, mm. but didn't solve them. And so VAR has been exactly the same. And it can be done better, let's say. It's got mm. to be done better because it's absolutely silly at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, so I was at that Palace game you know, uh, last night, and the first thought was, you know, on on, on the Zaha incident mm. was that's got to be a penalty, and obviously you see it live, and you, and then um, because of the, the coronavirus thing, normally we have televisions where you know we can we can see the replays, but you know, so we spread out socially distanced, and so we didn't have that, so we couldn't see the replay. But when I saw it later, I was like, oh, well, you know, well, well yeah, I mean. Questionable is the um, common you know, sense has gone out the window, isn't it? With it? And yeah. and you know, you, you see these some of the um, 
again, the first day of the season, it was at West Ham against um, uh, City. And there was a goal ruled out there from for, for offside on VAR, where I think it was Stale and ran from deep. And he, when, when, when they put the lines and you're thinking, where have they frozen this? At what mm. point? Because mm. live, it looked onside. And, and I've, I've run the line when, when sort of over the years. And, you know, I did a bit of refereeing when I was living in the States. Um, you know, so you could earn money doing it there. So it was worth it. Mm. Um, and I've run the line. So I, I, I think, I, you know, I know the rules. And I have a fairly good idea. And my first thought was, oh, he's on there. I thought, if they do go for VAR, he's got to get the benefits of the doubt. And he didn't. So the benefits of the doubt is, was made nonsense of it yeah. on the first day, the, the, the first Saturday of the season. Yeah. It's the same issue. I think it was a, I think Pookie scored a goal against Spurs at Carrow Road, I think. Yeah. And I remember that being disallowed. And at the time thinking like the same thing as you, like where though, at what moment has that been paused? Because when I saw it on one version, he looked on. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah. For me, unless it, unless it can be, and I appreciate there was that one error recently, wasn't there? But basically, by and large, goal line technology has been fantastic. It's just right every time because it's the actual technology. So unless the technology can come in where for me, it's just foolproof. And so we might, you might get to a time where there's a chip in the ball and there's a chipper in the player's boots and actually offside is automatic because you just know whether it's offside when it's passed, whatever that might look like in 10, 10 years time. But unless it can come in, for me, I'd, I'd simply be in favour of a one replay for the ref that's on the pitch. And if he likes, if, if he decides he wants to have another look or something, why does he need to go yeah. to another ref in somewhere else? So you, you had the instance, the Arsenal game, um, the Eddie Nketiah red card the other, the other night. And, you know, some people still say that's a bit harsh. And, but they ultimately, they took ages looking at VAR. Ref had one look and he gave the red card. And, you know, you can still disagree with whether it's a red or not. But it at least leaves it into the old, what we've all grown up knowing, which is rest words final. So the refs decide rest words final. So if the ref has another look at it, the guy that's on the pitch and he's decided you know, it's a red, for me, that, that will that be fine then? It's when it's going to someone else for, t- for five minutes or whatever it takes sometimes. That's when mm. it gets a bit, gets a bit tough. But. Yeah. Objective, objective decisions, whether the ball's over the line, you know, that can be done merely by technology. But subject, subjective yeah. decision yeah. Yeah. should only be the referee. Yeah. He's yes. the only one who should have a subjective. Yeah. I've always said that. It, it, a foul is an opinion. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, it might be reckless, but it's still an opinion. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. yeah. Well, I was just about to say, we've enjoyed that trip down memory, memory lane. Not always to um, come out on the uh, right side of an Arsenal fan against Liverpool fan, but it's still been nice. So, we really appreciate the, the chat, Tony. Yeah, a pleasure. No, and absolutely. obviously, we've got your book as our next competition, which is fantastic. Um, Bath Foreign Land. Yep, giving away a couple of copies of that to, to listeners and to um, followers of HJ Football. So um, they'll enjoy that and a little bit of insight for it tonight, which has been fantastic. Brilliant. Well, thanks, thanks, chaps. And it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thanks no, a lot, Tony. Appreciate it. Take it easy. Soon. Bye. Take care. To wrap up this episode, I'm joined by Liverpool fan and freelancer Tom Beatty. Stay tuned for the competition announcement in the outro. Well, welcome to HTO Football, Tom. It's great to have you on the show. This is actually like stoppage time um, for this for this yeah. pod. We've got you in added time with a bit of drama <laughs> late on, hopefully. Um, how are you? Are you well? Yeah, very well. Looking forward to tonight. Um, we're going to see the, the trophy lift, of course, and uh, it's been a long wait. Yeah, it's been a very long wait. I mean, it's well, it's been 30 years in the making, but it's this mm. has been... This has been two years in the making, hasn't it, Tom? I mean, last season, so, so close. It was almost yeah. perfection, wasn't it? Um, mm-hmm. Does it feel like it's been a two-year grind to get to this point? Yeah, I mean, you look at the comments, I think, yesterday from, from Jürgen Klopp, and I think even to the players, it, it, it seems to be a reflection of that as well. Um, but for me as a fan, um, I think you've got to see kind of this team as sort of um, having it roots, if you like, in that Kiev um, Champions League final, for me personally. I think that ever since that, uh, the team's been relentless, really. You look at the the, the league form, uh, the form at home at Anfield, mm. um, you know, it's been incredible. Um, and to go toe-to-toe with Manchester City, who, for all intents and purposes, have, have not really dropped points as such mm. up until this year. Um, I think we knew coming into this season that we had to have a bit of a faultless season, really, um, in order to kind of usurp them, if you like. And um, 
thankfully it, we've been able to do that and, and Man City I think at times this year have, have kind of struggled to keep pace a little bit but I, I think last year like you said it, it was kind of um, you know it was an aspect of getting used to that level a little bit mm. and um, you know it's easy to forget with that Man City team that you know, there was a point where, you know, they amassed 100 points in, in that year that we went to Kiev. Um, and, you know, they seemed far and away ahead of what we were, I think, in the league, of course. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think to be able to bridge that gap has, has probably been our biggest achievement, really. I think that, you know, we're not going to get 100 points, but I, I think to get, you know, in the high 90s is obviously at the mark of a fantastic football team. And, and to do that two years on the bounce, I think, is... Uh, incredible achievements as well but it just shows the levels now that you know teams have got to be at it to win the title I think that's what we've seen isn't it in the last two years well three years really is that gone are the days I mean Arsenal fan myself and Mm. we I can remember titles where we won the league with 78 80 points you know and it's just like you mentioned there the standard is the standard is up here now isn't it um yeah I think Yes, you could argue that you know Liverpool have obviously spent their money, but they've also recruited very cleverly in that time mm. as well, and they've sold yeah. very smartly as well at the same time. Um, yeah. And the the bar is you're looking at ninety ninety five minimum now. Mm. If, if you want to, be, well, hope, you never know; it could all change, can't it? Football changes quickly, yeah. but yeah. I mean, last season was was almost perfection. I mean, this year they, ironically, they haven't had to be perfect, have they? If you look at mm. that gap. Yeah. Did, did you ever feel like at the end of last season, when there was that last home game? I can't remember who you played last year at home, your last one, and yeah, it was this Wolves, sort of think, yeah, yeah, Wolves. That was yeah. it, and it's just this mm-hmm. feeling of almost celebration of such mm-hmm. an amazing season, yet nothing to show for it, which was so sad for that side. Did you yeah. feel at that moment that with this, because Klopp being Klopp, I I looked at that team and thought, there's no way they're going to see that as a oh. I could, we can't mm. go again but it was yeah. knew they were going to be ready from August bang on it well like I referenced before I think the Kiev um, disappointment if you like is the mark really of, of what this team is and I, I knew on that final day like you say the I think the mentality of, of that team and also just the body language I think you could tell from the players that obviously we had a, another European Cup final to come mm. uh, so it didn't feel like sort of the waste of a season or sure. like the, the season hadn't really ended up with much. Uh, we had that to look forward to, of course, but I did feel in the Wolves game, uh, there was that point in the game where I think um, for a couple of minutes we were in the driving seat. And I think the feeling in the ground at that moment, uh, I think we wanted to feel again, I think. And uh, I think the players felt that and, and a few of the players I've referenced that since Andy Robertson, of course, mm. came out and said that. So, mm. you know, I think, I think you're right to say, it, you know, the disappointment of last year, you know, missing out. And I, I knew when Vincent Company put um, the 30 yard pile driver in against um, Leicester, I think we all knew it, it was the kind of goal that wins a title really, weren't it? So, mm. um, you know, we went, into the next game that we had the next day uh, against Barcelona. Um, and to be able to win that, I think, again, shows the mentality of this team. Mm. So I think it's all kind of a chain of events that I think has happened over the past mm. couple of years where there has been, you know, a lot of disappointments for this Liverpool team. You even go back to the start of Jürgen Klopp's uh, reign at Liverpool where, you know, we lost the Europa League final, of course, and... It was a succession of finals that we did lose before before we ultimately won uh, mm. the European Cup last year. Um, mm. And it's been the same with the league. We, we've had to kind of bide our time. I think mm. we've had to raise our level. We've had to come up to the level of Manchester City of, of you know, earning 90-odd points to even be in, in the reckoning. Um, but yeah, like you say, I think last season, the disappointment on the final day, um, experiencing for the only time in my life up, up until then, being in the driving seat on the final day, um, you know, it's quite addictive, I think, not, not only for, for the players, but for, for the fans as well. And I think we felt that desperation in the ground a little bit mm. uh, this year. And, you know, we have been desperate to, to get over the line, even with um, COVID-19 as well. Well, that leads to my sort of next question, really, is that how do you feel about the form since winning the league? I mean, Klopp looks quite 
agitated on the sidelines. I think at the Emirates, there were some classic shots of him just looking <laughs> op- yeah. mouth open, like, what yeah. is going on here? Yeah. Um, and, but there's an element, I'm sure, that he, he understands what's happening and mm. that they're, they're finding it difficult to play with that sort of yeah. freedom, I suppose, because they've had to be at it, haven't they, for two years. Um, mm. What do you make of their form since, since winning the league? Well, well um, Chelsea won it for them, didn't they, at the bridge? Yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously been inconsistent. And um, I think the reason for that is the intensity that this Liverpool mm. team plays with. Uh, I think the big gap in time, it, it seems to corroborate a little bit with, with the gaps we've had with uh, the winter break in the past couple of years in the Premier League. I think we've struggled after January, pretty mm. much every season other than this one, uh, under Jurgen Klopp. Uh, there seems to be a correlation a little bit between these big breaks in, in a season. Mm. Obviously, there was nothing we could do about this one. Um, mm. But I do think kind of the, the intensity that uh, Jurgen Klopp teams need, mm. uh, particularly with the pressing from the front, um, I think it's cost Liverpool a little bit uh, since the restart. Um, but, you know, you, you look at the games like, like the Arsenal game that you talk about, I think... You know, we were probably caught on the break a couple of times, a couple of massive mistakes, really. Mm. I think I think was the big one. Um, so I think in some games we have to kind of accept as well that we're going to be unlucky. Yeah. Uh, I think it was one of those games where nothing seemed to go right. And, and you've, you've sort of you've earned the right, haven't you, the last two years to have an off day or two, really. Yeah, I mean, we, we spoke yeah. to t- and Tony on the show earlier and he, we asked him about how does he feel about the difference in style this season compared to mm. last season? Because I know I've read a few articles this year that perhaps they've managed games better. I mean, that, even though that yeah. sounds ridiculous because last mm. year they, the, 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 the points total they amassed. Mm. Um, has there been slight tweaks in the way players have played in games? Have they, have they been a little bit more careful? Mm. I think we've been machine-like this year. Um, we've been quite clinical with how we've seen games out. There's been many games I can think of. Um, probably the Leicester game where we won it um, yeah. in the final minute with a James Milner penalty, the Aston Villa game mm. early in the season. And, you know, examples like that are probably what I'd cite as being the, the key difference between this team uh, and the one of last year. Mm. It was starting to build momentum last year. You, you think of games like the Newcastle game, uh, away at Newcastle. Mm. We won it in the final couple of moments uh, with the Divock uh, header. It mm. seemed to be kind of snowballing at that stage as well, yeah. where we were in kind of traditional title-winning form. Uh, and I think a lot of people made that comment that we looked like a, a title-winning team at that point. And mm. I think what people are getting at is, is what you're saying, the... Yeah, we, we've kind of found ways of grinding out results, maybe when we haven't played well. Um, and I think that run that we went on um, of consecutive victories in the middle of the season was testament to that, really, and testament to kind of the atmosphere that Jürgen Klopp, I, I think, has uh, created at Liverpool, where, mm. you know, I think now that team is relentless um, in the same way that the, the, uh, the Man City team is, the... Um, obviously, they dropped off a little bit this season, but I'd expect them next year to, to be the same as they've been for, for the past three years, really. And hopefully Liverpool will be the same next year where we're grinding out clinical results like we have been this year as well. Mm-hmm. Well, being a Liverpool fan, I'm sure you like a bit of pressure. I know that Klopp's probably mm-hmm. trained you all to, to deal with it quite well. I'm going to put you under a bit of pressure now, Tom, with our yeah. counter-attack challenge. Yeah. So shortest answers possible, that'd be great. Yeah. So the first one we've got is favourite game this season? Leicester away. Mm. That was actually the game I, I was like, yeah, these guys are yeah. the deal. <laughs> I mean, there's the United game, obviously, where I think um, the writing was on the wall a, a mm. little bit with the title, where I think when Mo Salah broke through and um, we scored the goal yeah. late on, I think we knew then maybe you know the title was uh, coming home after. But next one then would be favourite goal this season? I think it'd be that Salah goal uh, against United. I think there was a feeling in the ground at that point. Um, I'll never be able to explain. I think we knew looking back, but we didn't want to. We didn't want to say it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm. Liverpool hero. It's a difficult one for me. It'll always be Steven Gerrard. I think that's um, just a homegrown hero. Um, Yeah. Yeah, he'll always be my football hero. I think. Where was Tom Beatty in Istanbul for Istanbul? 
I was at home uh, and I've, I've got distinct memories, I think, of being with my granddad in the garden um, and my head being down at half time um, coming over to me and saying, we're going to do it. And it was a ridiculous thing to say looking back now, but he seemed to believe it because uh, he'd witnessed four European Cup wins at that stage. Mm. So um, he's probably right to say it. So, yeah. Messi or Ronaldo? Messi for me. Yeah, good man. Yeah. One Premier League player you'd love to have at Liverpool? I think nowadays, probably Kevin De Bruyne. I think he's just on another planet, to be honest, mm. to any other midfielder in the league. He used to be David Silva. I used to love him. Uh, but I think mm. Kevin De Bruyne now is probably the, mm. the one opposition player, if you like, who I look at and think, I'd love mm. him in a, yeah. a Liverpool team. I, I, I thought there was an argument for three or four about a year ago, but he just seems to be... Yeah. He seems to be cementing himself now, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He's just incredible. Yeah. You know, the, the way he can pass a ball, uh, the finishing from long range. I think he drives that Man City onto a different level. Would well. he get into Liverpool's eleven? though? That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> I think he still probably would, yeah. but um, he'd have a massive uh, task Make, yeah. on his hands now. I Make room for him somewhere. Uh, Gordon, yeah. yeah. Oh, this would be an interesting one. First name on the team sheet. Jordan Anderson, I think, this year. Interesting. We spoke, yeah, to, Tony. We spoke to Tony about it, Jordan. Yeah, I think just the mentality that he's fostered in that team. Uh, he's been tantamount to that uh, alongside Jürgen Klopp. Uh, mm. He's been like a manager on the pitch. You see a, a real drop-off, I, I think, in, in form when he's not there. Um, and I just think, you know, he is the spirit of that team in one individual and he, mm. he more than deserves the title, I think, after, you know, eight to ten years of a bit of struggle early on in his career but I think uh, he is probably our most important player in some respects now mm -hmm. yeah definitely and then the last question for you we've got three dinner guests Tom mm. take away at yours scouse related if possible yeah who are you who are you inviting over football or any other um, no you can go go for what you like Probably will stick to football, actually. Uh, I'll keep it on topic. Um, I'd love to hear Gerard's recollections, I think, of uh, Istanbul. I think that'll always be um, an iconic moment for, for anyone, uh, particularly from my generation. Graham Sunas, I think, gives great insight. Um, yeah, he's got this steeliness about him that I quite like. Um, he's quite judgmental at times as well, I think, on, on the punditry. I'll probably have him. Uh, Another guest, probably Jürgen Klopp at the minute. Just, um, mm. I think he's the master really in, in the European game at the moment. And uh, I think it'd be an interesting discussion mm. between them three names. Sounds like a good chat. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. I think you'd have to have to save the uh, the slip chat with Gerard for after a few beers. <laughs> I, think so, yeah. I just don't think it'd get a mention, to be honest. I think, uh, yeah. I yeah. believe in that one at the door, I think. Yeah, so, that's mm. great. Well, you coped well there. Good man. Um, Thanks for that, Tom. It's been been a pleasure. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Great stuff. And um, good luck for well, hard for me to say, but good good luck for the future. Um, yeah, enjoy absolutely. tonight. <laughs> I will do definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know it's taken so long. I think even this year has felt like a real marathon. So yeah. Um, but you know, thirty years. If you allow yourself to look back, it's um. Mm. It does feel like a long wait, to be honest, and uh, I think we, we deserve it now, I think, as a team and, and mm. maybe as a fan base as well. I think the, this team's good enough now and, and you know, they've got what they, they've uh, deserved over the past yeah. couple of years. So Patience is a virtue, isn't it? I think absolutely. when you have to wait long enough for something, it just tastes better, doesn't it? So Yeah, absolutely. So enjoy the evening. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. It's competition time at HTO Football. We are giving away two signed copies of Tony Evans' book, Far Foreign Land. To be in with the chance of winning, keep an eye on our Twitter page, at HTO Football, for all the details. Good luck and take care.